In the entire universe, the two greatest scientific mysteries are, first of all, the origin of the universe itself, and second of all, the origin of intelligence. Believe it or not, sitting on our shoulders is the most complex object that Mother Nature has created in the known universe. You have to go at least 24 trillion miles to the nearest star to find a planet that may have life and may have intelligence. And yet our brain only consumes about 20, 30 watts of power, and yet it performs calculations better than any large supercomputer. So it's a mystery. How is the brain wired up? And if we can figure that out, what can we do with it to enhance our mental capabilities? When you look at the brain and all the parts of the brain, they don't seem to make any sense at all. The visual part of the brain is way in the back, for example. Why is the brain constructed the way it is? Is this nothing but an accident of evolution? Well, one way to look at it is through evolution. Some people think that intelligence is the crowning achievement of evolution. Well, if that's true, there should be more intelligent creatures on the planet Earth. But to the best of our knowledge, we're the only ones. The dinosaurs were on the Earth for roughly 200 million years. And to the best of our knowledge, not a single dinosaur became intelligent. We humans, modern humans, have been on the Earth for roughly 100,000 years. Only a tiny fraction of the 4.5 billion years that the Earth has been around. So you come to the rather astounding conclusion that intelligence is not really necessary. That Mother Nature has done perfectly well with non-intelligent creatures for millions of years, and that we as intelligent creatures are the new kid on the block. And so then you begin to wonder, how did we become intelligent? What separated us from the animals? Well, there are basically three ingredients, at least three, that help to propel us to become intelligent. One is the opposable thumb. You need a tentacle, a claw, an opposable thumb in order to manipulate the environment. So that's one of the ingredients of intelligence, to be able to change the world around you. Second is eyesight, but the eyesight of a predator. We have eyes to the front of our face, not to the side of our face, and why? Animals with eyes at the front of their face are predators, lions, tigers, and foxes. Animals with eyes to the side of their face are prey, and they are not as intelligent, like a rabbit. We say dumb bunny and smart as a fox. And there's a reason for that. Because the fox is a predator, it has to learn how to ambush. It has to learn how to have stealth, camouflage, it has to psych out the enemy and anticipate the motion of the enemy that is its prey. If you're a dumb bunny, all you have to do is run. And the third basic ingredient is language. Because you have to be able to communicate your knowledge to the next generation. And to the best of our knowledge, animals do not communicate knowledge to their offspring other than by simply uh, communicating certain primitive motions. There's no book, there's no language, there's no culture by which animals can communicate their knowledge to the next generation. And so we think that's how the brain evolved. We have an opposable thumb, we have a language of maybe five to 10,000 words, and we have eyesight, that is stereo eyesight, the eyesight of a predator, and predators seem to be smarter than prey. And then you ask another question, how many animals on the earth satisfy these three basic ingredients? And then you come to the astounding conclusion, the answer is almost none. So perhaps there's a reason why we became intelligent and the other animals did not. They did not have the basic ingredients that would one day propel us to become intelligent. That is, the back of the brain is the so-called reptilian brain the most ancient, primitive part of the brain that governs balance, territoriality, mating. And so the very back of the brain is also the kind of brain that you find in reptiles. And when I was a child, I would go to the science museum and look at the snakes sometimes, and they would stare back at me. And I would wonder, what are they thinking about? Well, I think now I know. What they're thinking about was, is this person lunch? Then we have the center part of the brain going forward, and that's the so-called monkey brain, the mammalian brain. 
the brain of emotions, the brain of social hierarchies. And then finally, the front of the brain is the human brain, especially the prefrontal cortex. This is where rational thinking is. And when you ask yourself a question, where am I anyway? The answer is right behind your forehead. That's where you really are. Well, I have a theory of consciousness which tries to wrap it all up together. There have been about 20,000 or so papers written about consciousness and no consensus. Never in the history of science have so many people devoted so much time to produce so little. Well, I'm a physicist. And when we physicists look at a mysterious object, the first thing we try to do is to create a model, a model of this object in space. And then we hit the play button and run it forward in time. This is how Newton was able to come up with the theory of gravity. This is how Einstein came up with relativity. So I tried to use this in terms of the human brain and evolution. So what I'm saying is I have a new theory of consciousness based on evolution. And that is, consciousness is the number of feedback loops required to create a model of your position in space with relationship to other organisms and finally in relationship to time. So think of the consciousness of a thermostat. I believe that even a lowly thermostat has one unit of consciousness. That is, it senses the temperature around it. And then we have a flower. A flower has maybe, maybe 10 units of consciousness. It has to understand uh, the temperature, the weather, humidity, where gravity is pointing. And then finally we go to the reptilian brain, which I call level one consciousness. And reptiles basically have a very good understanding of their position in space, especially because they have to lunge out and grab prey. Then we have level two consciousness, the monkey consciousness, the consciousness of emotions, social hierarchies. Where are we in relationship to the tribe? And then where are we as humans? As humans, we are at level three. We run simulations into the future. Animals apparently don't do this. They don't plan to hibernate. They don't plan the next day's agenda. They have no conception of tomorrow to the best of our ability, but that's what our brain does. Our brain is a prediction machine. And so when we look at the evolution from the reptilian brain to the mammalian brain to the prefrontal cortex, we realize that it's the process of understanding our position in space with respect to others, that is emotions, and finally running simulations into the future. Animals don't do that. In fact, animals don't even have much of a memory. When you look at a brain scan of what is the brain doing when it's thinking, thinking hard, what is the brain doing? You find out that the prefrontal cortex is active and it is accessing memories of the past. You see, animals don't do that. Animals have not much of a memory. They don't see the future because there's no necessity to see the future. There's no necessity to have much of a memory. In fact, the purpose of memory could be to simulate the future. Animals don't need it. Why didn't the dinosaurs become intelligent? Well, they didn't need to become intelligent because we, saw, we humans sometimes over-exaggerate the importance of intelligence. Intelligence is not necessary to live in the forest, but we are maladapted to live in the forest. We don't run very fast. We can't fly, where our skin is very fragile, we're not very strong, we have only one thing going for us, our brain, and what separates us from the animals? We see the future, we plot, we scheme. So that's my theory of, of intelligence. And then you can, you can then categorize animals, you can categorize machines on the, on the basis of this category. Level one would be alligators. Level two would be monkeys, I mean not monkeys, but uh, social animals like wolves. Level three would be just us, okay? We have the third level of consciousness. And then what about robots? What do robots have? Robots would be level one. They can barely see what's around them and start to make some changes. They don't have emotions. 
They don't see social hierarchy. They can't interact socially with humans. And of course, they certainly don't see the future in all its forms. Now they can simulate parts of the future. They can model airflow on an airplane wing, for example. So robots can see the future in one direction. We see the future in all directions. Then the next question asked in Planet of the Apes and asked in any number of science fiction movies is, can you accentuate intelligence? Can you take an ape and make the ape intelligent? Well, believe it or not, the answer could be yes. We are 98.5% genetically equivalent to a chimpanzee. Only a handful of genes separate us from the chimps, and yet we live twice as long and we have thousands of words in our vocabulary. Chimps can have maybe just a few hundred. And we've isolated many of those genes that separate us from the chimpanzees. For example, the ASP gene governs the size of the crane, cranial capacity, so that by monkeying with just one gene, you can literally double the size of the brain case and the brain itself. And so in the future, not today, but in the future, we may use gene therapy to begin the process of making perhaps a chimpanzee intelligent. We know the genes that will increase the size of the brain. We've isolated now the genes that give you manual dexterity by which you can make tools. We have found the genes which give you the ability to articulate thousands of words. And so it may be possible to tinker with the genome of a chimpanzee so that they have a larger brain case, they have better manual dexterity, and they have the ability to articulate a larger vocabulary. But then what do you get? You get a primate that looks very similar to a human. And so my personal attitude is, why bother? We already have humans, just look outside the door. So why bother to manipulate a, a chimpanzee? Because as you make a chimpanzee more and more intelligent, it becomes more and more human-like with a vocabulary, with vocal cords, with manual dexterity, with a larger brain case, and a spine to support a larger brain case. That's called a human.